I've debated posting this for a while, mainly because I'm not a writer. It's a long story, apologies in advance for the length, and I don't want to mess it up in the telling. This happened to me and my friend Sam three winters ago. We liked exploring nature and walking around outside. Our friends had recently introduced us to this beautiful place in Wisconsin, Grant Park for anyone familiar with southeastern Wisconsin parks, that we had visited with them three or four times. Every time we had gone with them, it was an extremely pleasant trip. We walked around, got to see some beautiful views of Lake Michigan, sat in crooks of trees and talked about books and games and all other manner of things. We had been starting a new game of Hunter the Darkness, a tabletop RPG game like Dungeons and Dragons. We were using the park for a bit of scenic inspiration. It was pretty great, actually. For the purpose of storytelling, my friend and I are 5'2 slash 5'3 females. The first time she and I went alone, we went around dusk to take some pictures we could Photoshop for the game. The park was massive. There were many bridges, footpaths, and winding roads throughout. We were walking over this bridge that sat against one of the roads, with dense woods on either side. As we were crossing, this car drives slowly by and rolls down the window. Some guy we don't know leans out and says, Hey! at us. We were both startled and jumped in surprise, but we dismissed them and continued walking across the bridge. Less than a minute later, that same car comes driving the other direction. This time, the driver's side window rolls down, and the driver, another male, calls out to us. Hey ladies, come here! We picked up our pace. The car drives away, and right as we're about to hit the end of the bridge, we see it come at us again from the original direction. We book it up into the trees, up the hill, and hear the car stop, and the two men start to yell for us. We continued running, and hid in the dark for 15 or so minutes until they left. We ran back to our car and drove away. You would think we would avoid this park after that, but once we had gotten out of there and properly warmed over a hot chocolate from Parkins, we had a good laugh over having been so scared. We went back to the park with our male friends a few times. Nothing even remotely scary had happened, so she and I decided to go back, again, just the two of us. Sam and I often spent our afternoons and early evenings exploring the outside, hiking, geocaching, just sitting outside in parks and talking. So we had just decided to add it to our repertoire. We headed back around dusk again, with the camera ready to take more pictures, especially since we hadn't gotten the shots we wanted to the first time. Now obviously, looking back on this, we both feel incredibly foolish having gone back alone, and around the same time and same place as well. As I said though, we had gone a few more times with our male friends, and even when we had just one male with us, nothing had happened, so we thought we were just being skittish. Anyways, we did go back and were about to walk over the same bridge, when a car rolls by, and as you guessed, the window rolls down. Some guy just yells out this random noise. This time though, we don't wait for them to drive around. We duck out into the woods and start walking back toward the pier. We figured we'd abandon the other photo spot and just explore the pier and take some like shots instead. Not exactly what we were looking for, but we figured if we made it in time for the sunset, which was almost all the way down at that point, we could take some nice pictures over the lake just for fun. The way that the pier is set up is that there is a long, thin road from the top of a giant grass hill, down and around a curve and into the parking lot. The pier is right at the end of the right side of the parking lot, about 200 yards away. If you walked from near the pier down the right side of the lot, there was a little bridge that led to a development with a tennis court that sat right next to the preserve. We began walking down the road to the lake when the same car from before drives down into the parking lot by the pier. They didn't say anything as they drove past this time. We still decided to slow down and decide whether or not we wanted to continue going to the pier. The car turned around in the parking lot and came back up the road. It reached where we were and suddenly stopped. We immediately turned and started walking down the hill. All of the windows rolled down at once. We could see that there were four guys and one girl in the car. Hello. Sam and I turned around and waved. One of them called out. Hey, you're cute. 
The others joined in. Hey, yeah, wait for us. Now mind you, we're two small females, but we're also super bundled up in large winter coats and hats. You could barely see any of our faces or our shapes, so they really didn't have a lot to base this sentence on. We had been ignoring them when we hear someone call out, We're coming back for you, as they drive up the hill. Sam and I decided not to take any chances. We started running now. We hear hooting and hollering and see them disappear over the top of the hill. We start running toward the bridge, and once you've gotten over the bridge to the left, there was a concrete deck with a drop-off to a ramp about five feet tall, so that if you got off the bridge and jumped down right away, you'd be at the bottom of the ramp. You couldn't be seen from the other side if you ducked down, which is exactly what we did. We hear the car speed back down the hill, all four doors open and close, as they start screaming and laughing. Hey, come here, girls. We'll be nice. We just want to play. Most of them took off to the pier, but two of them stayed behind. We could make out bits and pieces of what they were saying. Hey, where do you think they went? I don't know, we'll find them. Sam and I were huddled and obviously freaked out. Once it had been silent near the bridge for a while, we decided to peek out to see if the other two had also left so we could sneak back up the hill, or maybe make a break for it somewhere else. We peek over. There's a guy on the other end of the bridge, clearly staring at us. Over here, he screams to his buddies. He starts running across the bridge to us. We take off toward the development, running around the side of the tennis court while being chased by three of the guys. Only one of them was very close to us, about 30 feet away, but the rest were catching up faster than we would have liked. We took a quick turn between two houses in the subdivision. We luckily never saw them again from that point on. We got back to our car by walking through the forest preserve incredibly slowly, dashing across roads, terrified out of our minds. We left that night and called our friends we normally went to the preserve with. From then on, they insisted on accompanying us any time we went out there. Throwaway account. I wanted to write this story for over a year, but didn't know if people would find it interesting. Here goes, I guess. This happened in the early thousands. I was probably in first grade, or maybe a year younger. This took place in Bulgaria. I'm from a mid-sized town. Not too small, not too big. The perfect size for raising your children. Crime is pretty much unheard of. You can sleep outside on a bench and nothing would happen to you. One weekend, some family friends from a nearby town came to my town to visit, and my parents and I decided to go to the park with them. It's important to say that all of the parks in my town are located right on the edge of town. So they're basically a combination of park and forest. At some point, the park just merges right in. Since it's not a very big town, we don't have central parks. In the park that we went to, it runs along a river, so it's a very narrow alley, but a very long one. On one side, there's the river. On the other, there's the thick forest and the cliffs. At that time, I didn't like that park so much, because it was a very long walk, and you had to walk a lot to get to the end of it. So, like most kids, I got bored of walking with my parents and the other family, since they were talking about grown-up stuff and I didn't want to listen to them. I decided to run off ahead, and by ahead I mean completely out of sight from my parents. Keep in mind that this is a one-alley park, which you walk only straight forward with slight curves due to the river, so I had gone pretty far ahead. Usually in this park there are always people, and it's quite crowded on the weekends. Since it was summer, most of the people were on family vacations, though. It was surprisingly empty, and I couldn't see anyone in a straight line either way. At that point, I started to hear something in the forest. It was pretty loud since on the other side was the river, and that was loud by itself. I stopped and started staring in. I saw how the bushes were moving around and coming toward my direction. I was still pretty clueless to what was happening until I saw a man with long hair, a band across his forehead, dressed like a hunter with an air rifle on his back, running full speed towards me. There was no freezing moment. 
I just started bolting in the opposite direction, screaming my lungs out for my parents, hoping they could hear me. Because of the sound of the rushing river, though, I doubted anyone could have heard me from a hundred meters away. I remember looking backward, seeing him still chasing me, and thinking to myself, maybe this is the end. It's over. I was imagining how he would catch me and drag me back into the forest, and I would never see my family or friends again. It felt like an eternity of running, but finally I saw my parents and our family friends. My whole face was completely red. I was crying and snotting like crazy, barely breathing. The hunter also stopped running after he saw my parents and the others. I remember they started screaming at him. What the hell was he doing? I don't remember what exactly he said. I was just relieved it was over. I remember him slowly shaking his head, saying, I did nothing wrong. I was only trying to help him. The weirdest part was that there's no game in that park. It's a park, after all, and the forest that he was hiding in is max 50 meters in width before the cliffs begin. It's impossible to have any game there since there are always people walking. You can see wild foxes, but that's about it. You need to go well beyond the park into the forest to hunt any game. Also, it's highly illegal to carry a firearm out in public. We have very strict laws on firearms. Only police and military personnel are allowed to carry them. I don't know anyone who owns a gun. Civilians are allowed to register only air guns for hunting. No hardcore weapons allowed. Of course, you're not allowed to carry them in a park where there are people either. Only in regulated zones for hunting game away from the populated areas. You would never see hunters like that unless you go deep into these zones or you're in a village, which is very rare. No, we didn't report it afterward. Too much hassle. This was the first and last time something like that has happened to me ever, thankfully, and I haven't developed a fear of that place. Even now, when I go back to my town, I go running in that park after midnight, and I'm usually perfectly fine. So, I have no idea what that was. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son, who was eight months old at the time, and my dog Henry, an Irish wolfhound Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and meet up with them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining down. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was laughing and smiling. I would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in front of me at the time. Henry was sniffing around and whining excitedly, as if to say, let's go. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. The towering trees mixed with pine. A crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at different points. We would periodically stop and play, all three of us together. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone 2.5 or around 3 miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s. Henry began snarling and lunging for the man before I could even completely register what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry just would not calm down. This was very unusual behavior for him, but not if he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass right by you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange too, which I found a bit odd. The man was staring very intently at him. Then he laughed slightly and said, Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. He motioned to something around his neck and said, I'm just out here taking some pictures. It's a hobby of mine, you could say except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck, or anywhere I could see. He had a canteen. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he tried anything, 
and I'm positive this guy felt that as well. The man stared at Henry for a few moments, then looked back at my son once again. He took a few steps off trail, so there was room to get by. At that point, Henry couldn't reach him when we walked by. As I walked by him, he was about ten feet to my left at this point. He muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as we walked away, to make sure he didn't turn around and start walking after us. He continued to stare at us for several minutes, though, until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars could park. There was no one there, and luckily I had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away. Then they took us back to my car. There was no sign of the guy we encountered on the trail. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away. I'm sad my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He really was the best dog ever. I know everyone says that about their dog, but he really was. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that's ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my entire life. To this day, I still do not know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I'm sorry for how long this geographical description is. I just want everyone to understand how secluded I was when this happened, and how badly it could have ended if not for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting uni. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town, with forests on all sides. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few small streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forest there quite well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest, because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down, and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never, in my entire time doing this, did I ever see anyone else in that forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found quite strange. I listened well, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving toward the sound. Yeah, I know, I'd be the first person to die in a horror movie, but I was heading north anyway, so what the hell? I realized it couldn't have been an animal, though. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving, and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big or strong enough to carry a bell like that, that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was far too still. I thought of everything, but nothing could explain that sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally. That is, until I found a badger. A bloomin' dead one. Carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp, and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, and so had I. So, the badger was put there, maybe killed there, at least decapitated while I was walking that way. I suppose I don't know, really. Nothing else happened for the rest of that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. 
I left home at around 6 p.m. I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I came. It was getting late and was starting to rain quite heavily. The sun sat at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while, through the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, with his head strung to his front paws. It looked a bit like a ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree, almost like a literal load of bollocks. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I could feel some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently. I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain, and my senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung the body up after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone who knew I would see it. So, was someone watching me? Running around the forest? with the faint sounds of those branches breaking around me. Not just animals? I looked around nervously and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream back toward the path for a while when I heard that bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part to me, to go as fast as he could, and that someone was with me in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had, it was like I just shit out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise, despite being completely soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on way longer than the last time, on and off. It felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear, combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flip and breathe properly, was making me lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a goddamn horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing all these sounds around me. I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path. I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half-running, half-speed-walking thing again because I was completely out of breath. Suddenly, I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and that bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. I don't know if I have a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I fucking didn't look back once. I screamed as loud as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path already. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that part to myself. I could feel something awful was going to happen. I felt the man right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck. Then, switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name. I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation in his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got closer. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car, ready to leave fast.
My story takes place when I was about 13 years old. I'm 19 now if the details are unclear. I had just moved into a small countryside town, into a house that was just beside a huge forest. It was a new neighborhood and didn't really have much houses on my street. You could without a doubt walk hours into the woods and still be going. Being young and stupid, I'd take my dog walking without having my parents with me or anything to protect me. I don't even remember taking a cell phone with me. Don't blame my parents, please. They were reassured by the fact that my dog was really big and people were easily frightened by him. Really, extremely easily. My dog was about seven at the time. I did that often. Nothing bad ever happened and I had never met anyone out there. I really loved it actually because I could really take my mind off of everything else that was happening in my life. The moving was kind of rough on me, and to make everything more fun, I was bullied at school too. So I really needed this alone time. So there I was casually walking on a track that's across the wood that's used if you have a motocross or a quad. A noise that at first I didn't pay too much attention to was coming from right behind me. It started to become slowly louder. When I turned back, I could see a person coming straight at me on his motorcycle. I'm a 13-year-old girl who's scared of just about everything that seems out of the ordinary. I decide to get off the track as quickly as I can and hide. Unfortunately for me, Henry is black and does not blend in with the surroundings as everything was quite green and it was in the middle of the day as well. I walked pretty fast, but I could tell that the biker was getting closer and I was pretty obvious. I started running and found a rock that was big enough to hide my dog and I behind. I heard the motocross come and go. It was impossible for the person to see us really. I waited, telling myself I was just being a little silly. When I thought I had waited long enough for him to be long gone, I started walking again. I froze instantly when I heard the loud engine becoming suddenly so close to me. Without hesitation, I started running like hell. When I was able to stop and hide, I did. My dog wasn't in the best shape, and I was feeling bad for making him run so much. I could tell that the biker was getting closer and closer to me. It wasn't an extremely dense forest, so he could still follow me on his bike, which meant he was so much faster than me. I'm a clumsy person. I trip on just about everything I can, so when I met this lovely branch, I fell on the ground pretty hard after tripping on it. So when I met this lovely branch, I fell on the ground pretty hard after tripping over it. I think I was so full of adrenaline though, that I just got up and started running again. He was meters from me. He could see me, and was clearly chasing me. There was no doubt in my mind that if he got me, something really bad would happen. We were approaching a more dense part of the forest, so the guy had no choice but to stop his bike. It did give me an advantage on him, and I was able to get away from him. I was so glad when I saw a house come into view. It was under construction at the time, so nobody lived in it yet. I did find a hiding spot behind the fence. Minutes later, I saw the biker come close to me. I could tell he hadn't seen where I'd gone. I felt this huge relief when he started to go away. I think I hid for maybe another 30 or 40 minutes without moving to make sure he did not come back. I did find my way home and told my parents all about it but they thought I was just being dramatic. In the end, I never knew who this person was. I did get hurt running through the forest, but nothing too serious. I heard years later that weed was being grown in a part of the woods, with cameras all around. Maybe I came too close to one of them, and they saw me on the cameras. I also went with friends of mine when I was older, and found a small abandoned house not too far from where this happened. So I live in the Pacific Northwest, which has a great number of excellent campsites. A favorite of mine isn't actually a designated campsite, but instead a forest road right on a river. Being a moody young woman, I would frequently make sojourns in my dumpy Toyota Camry to this one spot, just so I could be alone on the river and meditate on whatever might be bothering me. Camping alone as a 20-something female often inspired anxiety in both myself and my folks, but I didn't let that deter me. 
camping alone was something I genuinely enjoyed doing, and after experiencing a series of emotional misfortunes, I needed the time to myself. The last time I ever went to this particular spot, I must have been around 21 or so, I had just had a closure conversation with someone who broke my heart some months prior and wanted to take some time to process that. Luckily enough, I had gotten consecutive days off from my retail job, so I packed up my car and made the three-hour drive to the spot. This spot is fairly well known and often a few other campers would be there on the weekends, but during the week it was more than likely to be empty. By the time I had arrived, it was late afternoon already. I was slightly disappointed to discover a turquoise Chevrolet truck and another silver car parked closest to the river. I parked some distance behind them and began to unload my things. Two young gentlemen were hanging out by the truck, and as I passed by, they greeted me. I muttered a hello and kept on walking. I picked a spot I thought was nice and went back to get the rest of my things. As I was passing by their cars again, one of the men, the shorter, stockier one, rushed to a boulder near the path where some pistols were sitting and quickly concealed them. I learned later they were air pistols. He told me, Oh, uh, sorry about that, I didn't mean to scare you. There was something childlike in his manner, like he did this specifically so I would pay attention to him. I told him it was fine, I wasn't scared, and kept walking. I unloaded the rest of my things and set up my camp and got a fire going. I was kind of tired after the long day of driving and hauling my stuff around, so I plopped down in a camp chair and got some chili mac cooking for dinner. It was a beautiful morning, not too hot, and golden hour on the river is always a fantastic thing, so I was thoroughly enjoying the moment. I could see the two men swimming up river a bit, but it was easy enough to ignore them. By the time I'd finished eating, they passed by my camp on the opposite bank and were walking into the woods. I went down to the bank to get some water from my dishes when I heard the stockier one call out to me. Uh, hey, I just wanted to let you know I'm a good guy, okay? Maybe this should have alarmed me more, but at the time it didn't. I definitely just thought the guy was socially inept, but left my judgments at that. I elected to answer with a polite and safe, okay, I just wanted him to leave me alone, and thought that if I was nice but uninterested, he would take the hint. This was a demonstrably ineffective approach. Some time had passed, and I had been musing over the last week's events and just generally enjoying the beauty around me, when the man came limping up to my camp. He was doing this feigned grunt as if he was in pain. I don't remember the exact exchange we had, but he wound up sitting at my camp and explaining to me, that he had had some injuries in the past that were adversely impacted by the cold of the water. Before I go any further, I'll preface this by saying I was a pretty passive younger person, especially with strangers. I've definitely had to practice setting and maintaining boundaries as I've gotten older, and this instance demonstrates the danger of failing to do so. I kick myself every time I tell this story. I'm not sure if immediately telling this guy to piss off would have made him leave me alone, being a young, pretty girl alone in the woods, but I regret not speaking my mind more clearly that day. All that said, given some previous experiences, I had taken on a policy of engaging in active listening with others who seemed to be struggling. I've obviously faced my own woes and wanted to be treated compassionately, so I aim my best to do the same with others. It was clear this guy was having issues, and by all exterior judgments seemed like he was down on his luck, even maybe with some maladaptive tendencies. He continued to stay at my camp and began telling me all about his life. These stories were pretty fantastical, the kind of lies a child would tell you of some incredible adventure or grandeur. As they continued to go on, they went into weirder and weirder territory. He explained that the aforementioned injuries that were paining him were the result of falling a great distance while on a welding job, where his hand was caught being impaled by a piece of rebar. He described his heroic efforts of self-preservation by unhooking himself from the rebar and falling the rest of the distance, breaking his legs or something like that. And I just gave him a series of, uh -huh, yeah, oh wow, that must have been painful. He revealed that he was recently homeless after splitting up with his girlfriend, 
who had been talking to another guy. That's why he was staying here in his truck. The aforementioned Chevy. He also told me he'd DJ'd a joint in the closest town and made a lot of money doing it. He kept increasing his exaggerations, telling me he was also a five-star chef, and enlightened me on a gross-sounding dish of his own creation, essentially a soup made from watered-down fruit jelly and some other sweet things. He also told me he had once been a Navy SEAL specializing in small arms. It was then when he revealed to me that the pistols he'd thought scared me before were air pistols, and augmented his tale of being in special forces by demonstrating some twirls with one of them and showing me what ultimately turned out to be some really mediocre marksmanship. At a later point, he even wound up giving me one of them because it made him think of doing bad things. I hesitantly accepted it. I was pretty sketched out by this point and wanted the man to leave me alone, but lacked the backbone to tell him to just go away. Unfortunately, as the evening wore on, he continued to get weirder and weirder. By this point, he had been bringing his belongings from his truck and setting them up around my camp. This was a process that happened gradually, each new conversation note eliciting a new show-and-tell idea. I can't remember all the things he brought down. It included his guitar and a lot of other stuff. He even tried to give me some of it, but after the air pistol, I declined. The conversation dragged on, eventually with him telling me in detail about some of his childhood traumas. His father, who had been in the military, was very strict and often beat him. His cousin, who had sexually abused him severe enough to leave scars in certain areas, which he described to me in detail. He got really close to me when he told me this, looked me square in the eye unblinking, and said, And that's why I'd never hurt you. He stared at me the whole time. I shit you not, my skin started to crawl. I had a few things to defend myself with, a hunting knife and some bear spray, but he hadn't done anything directly threatening yet. Not long after this, his ex-girlfriend showed up. He introduced me as his friend, and they talked a little bit before he kind of ignored her in favor of me. The whole thing just made me even more uncomfortable. She didn't stay long, and sped away in her truck, I'm assuming maybe in some fit of jealousy. What did I do to deserve that? I didn't say anything other than that I was going to bed, hoping he'd take the hint and leave. He said he needed some alone time himself, and I thought I had lucked out. I went into my tent to put down bed for the night, as it had gotten quite dark, only to discover that a cheap ring had been left on my pillow. He must have placed it there when I went to step away to go to the bathroom or something. Furthermore, I could hear him wandering around my campsite. I peeked out of my tent. He had his head in his hands as he paced and started muttering to himself. A powerful feeling of needing to flee suddenly came over me. There was no way I could stay there, even if he didn't do anything to hurt me. At minimum, he would annoy me for the whole three days I planned to stay. Immediately, I started packing up my stuff. Then, he asked what I was doing. I told him I was just going to go. Since I was car camping, I had a bit of stuff with me that would require a few trips. I hurried to get it all to my car. One trip of the path to the parking area, he stood in the middle of the path complaining that my flashlight was blinding him. I didn't say anything and ran around him. Most of my trips after that were unbothered, although I went with one arm free so I could carry my hunting knife and be ready in case he tried to get physical with me. On my second to last trip down, he came out of the dark from the direction of his truck. He was sobbing and crying. But, but I didn't do anything wrong. I flat out ignored him and ventured down the path once more to grab what I could and hightailed it to my car. I wound up leaving a cord of wood behind, not seeing it worth the danger to go back for it. I shut all my doors and hopped in, absolutely elated at the sound of my 30-year-old car starting up. I got the hell out of there and drove the whole three hours back to my house. I didn't have reception until about halfway through the drive, during which point I called my mom and told her what happened. She was upset that I didn't tell her where I was going and that she was glad I was okay. When I got back, my stepmother asked what I was doing back so soon. I explained what happened all over again. My dad suggested I get a gun if I wanted to continue this solo camping, in case something like that happened again. The next day, I went out to my car so I could drive to meet some friends, and found my tire had gone flat. What an immense stroke of luck that it didn't happen at the campsite, or somewhere else in the mountains where I didn't have reception. I'm in my mid-twenties now and moved to the city about six months ago. 
My roommate and best friend discovered the air pistol while he was helping me move. He knew I didn't own any guns and was immediately confused, thinking it was real. When he asked me about it, I had a little laugh and explained this whole story. I haven't been back to that site since, and while I'd definitely bring a friend there, I probably won't go alone ever again. Years ago, man am I old, but let's say mid-1990s, I worked as a woodland firefighter in the Army Reserves. I worked as a spotter. Basically, I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was just as it sounds. I would use binoculars and look out for fire, smoke, other telltale signs of a flame. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from me. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on the lookout for anyone who might be having illegal fires, looking out for wildlife, and staying afoot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on, one week off. We slept in the towers, cooked our food, did everything there. There were nearby showers and toilets too. Well, one day I came across an illegal bear trap. I had several ranger friends, and I safely set off the trap, then picked it up to take to the ranger station on one of my treks out for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park and carried a big fine, even back then. Some jail time as well, but that never stopped the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back from my fire tower. We did have a rifle there, to be used in case of emergencies. Just a few months back, a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly, so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars but could not see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my coworker Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He said he hadn't heard anything today, but had come across quite a few traps himself. That night, after a dinner of frank and beans and toast, I was writing to my future wife when I heard the rumbling of a truck. Thinking it may be Ben, occasionally he made the trek over. We would crack open a soda and chew the fat for a bit. Instead, I saw four men with rifles emerge from the truck. One looked around and leaped up against it, while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed the rifle and my lantern and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from a rural Virginia farming town, and even with one deployment behind me, I was naive. I should have called it in to the rangers, but instead I thought I could talk some sense into the four dangerous men. I barely managed to get out a, hey, what are you doing? Before I was roughly shoved, my lantern fell and I heard it crack. My rifle was kicked away from me, and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in the stomach. I had barely caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men and shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles, but in reality it was probably only a single one. I did notice that there were no sounds. The forest is very rarely silent. It's a cacophony of sounds even at night. Owls, wolves, crickets. But on this night, nothing. Suddenly I was shoved onto my knees, and I felt hot tears welling up. I thought of my parents, my little sister, my brother and my fiancé were back home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun. I shut my eyes and prayed. Suddenly, the quiet night erupted with noise. It was the sound of sirens, those of the forest rangers, and behind them in his pickup, Ben, who had tried to radio me that he had heard a car's engine and came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were immediately arrested. Ben drove me back to the tower as I was still shaking. He didn't lay into me for not following procedure. He just looked over at me and said, That was close, kid. I ended up leaving the job months later to take a job closer to home, but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sent him a wedding invite and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. As time usually goes, however, we lost track of one another. A few years back, I googled him. He would have been 75 or so. I discovered he passed away a few years back. I don't know whatever came of those poachers but I know I never want to meet them again. Uh, 
Hello, I'm French, so I apologize if I make any mistakes in advance. As I just told you, I live in France, and this story happened to me this summer, just after the lockdown ended. I am and was 19 at the time. After the lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents' house to spend a few weeks. I got tested before this, so no problems there. My grandparents live in a small city in the north of France. They have a dog who's quite big. When I was really young, I lived at my grandparents for about a year. At that time, the dog was only a puppy. Her name is Chippy, in French, which kind of means little devil in English, but in a more affectionate way. Considering that when I was living there, I played with her quite a lot. We are both really close, and this will have its importance later. Two of my favorite hobbies are having long walks and running. Thus, every evening, I was going out for a long walk with that dog. There's a track that follows a path through the forest. Then there's a small hill, and on top of that, a big place with a lot of fields there. I run there a lot, so I know the place quite well. The air is fresh, and the view is very beautiful. I was going there with the dog almost every day. It was also helping my grandparents having her do a lot of exercise and get some of the energy out. The first time we went there, nothing too special happened. We just enjoyed our walk. It's about six to seven kilometers, so basically an hour long walk. The next day, when we arrived on top of the hill, in the field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was still some light because it was summer. There were three other persons walking. They were younger than me, probably about 15 or 16. I also noticed they were smoking. My guess was that they used to come here so they wouldn't be seen by their parents. We walked past them, I greeted them politely, and they greeted me back. Once again, nothing special there. For a whole week, I did this walk at around the same time, 10 p.m., and passed those three guys with nothing special happening. It was perfectly fine to me this way. The second week, as usual, I went for the walk with Chippy. We arrived at the fields. It was only one of those three boys. He wasn't smoking this time, though. When he saw me, I was at the entrance of the field just after the little hill climb, so the entrance of the forest was just behind me. He did a sign with his hand to catch my attention and asked me if I had a lighter. I actually did have one in my pocket. I told him, yeah, sure. He walked over to me, his hands in the pockets of his hoodie. As he came closer, for some reason I felt a shiver run through my body. It's crazy how sometimes your instinct just knows there's a problem, but you don't listen to it because nothing looks weird to you. I handed over the lighter when he passed by. At that moment, my dog was staring intently right at him. Everything suddenly happened really fast. He did a fast hand movement, with his hand emerging from the hoodie. I only saw something shining. I just had a reflex of throwing myself back, so hard that I actually fell down. I realized that it was a knife he was holding, and he had just tried to stab me. What saved me is my dog, God bless her. When she saw the man was trying to stab me, she jumped on him and he fell down. I immediately got up to my feet and heard something behind my back. From the entrance of the forest, I saw two men wearing animal masks running toward me. They were probably the two friends from before. In this moment, your brain just acts by itself. You don't think at all. In this case, the answer it found was really simple. The other guy was still on the ground. I just watched my dog and told her, Run! I started running and she took off after me. I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who had just gotten up. Catch him. Don't let him get away. At this moment, I was totally terrified. I was just running and running. I could hear them sprinting behind me. I was only thinking to myself, How long will they follow me? Who the hell are these guys? This was the first time I was really happy to be a runner. I was clearly better than those guys, and that totally saved me. They chased me for what felt like an eternity. Fortunately, at the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest. This time, it's a descent with the road at the end. I heard the steps of the three men vanishing as I arrived at the end of the forest. I didn't stop running, though, until I arrived at my grandparents' house and locked myself in. I took a second to catch a big breath and gave a huge hug to my dog. I saw in her eyes that she totally understood what happened. I've never been so happy to have her in my life. After that, I told everything to my grandparents. 
We called the police, but they didn't find anyone. I don't know what these guys wanted, but the animal masks really made me think about some kind of Satanists. I really don't want to know either way. I do still enjoy long walks with Chippy, my hero dog, but now I go out earlier, and to places with a little more people around. Hey folks, I'm kinda new and this is the first story I've submitted here. Anyway, let's get started. I must clarify that this did not only happen to me, but my uncle as well. This was right after a Christmas Eve party, when everyone had gone home. I decided to stay because my cousin and I were still watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs into the woods next to a park, went off to take them out for the night. Before he decided to do this, my aunt had pleaded with him not to do that, because it was already too dark out. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. He never cared much for that sort of thing, though. He went off anyway. My aunt was really worried, so she sent me to go along with him. Once we started out, nothing wrong seemed to happen. Everything was perfectly quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a very relaxing walk as usual. I wasn't really paying too much attention to the surroundings, but suddenly, the dogs went completely still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped on their way to stare and bark at other animals they noticed like rats, birds, insects, or other dogs. This time was different though. When the dogs got still, my uncle and I noticed that something was very wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They looked kind of nervous, anxious, afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness. We could hear them saying something. We all gather here by the blood of incomprehensible. We... As me and my uncle began to hear that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. We all left. As we did, he turned his head back and saw a slight movement of branches and shrubs. Perhaps because these people were now trying to hide. After all that happened, he decided to never walk his dogs near those woods again, nor when it got dark out either. Hi everyone. My story is long, but I feel like the details are important to understand just how creepy this actually was. So this creepy encounter happened about 10 years ago, when I was 17 or so. I'm a female, by the way. I was taking a course in Tamarindo, Costa Rica. I'm originally from Canada. It's important to note that before being sent to Costa Rica to take a month-long language course, not only was I a wild, irresponsible teenager with no regard for my own safety, but I was also dabbling in some recreational substances. Cocaine, MDMA, K, whatever was given to me really. By the time I was sent to Costa Rica, I had a pretty serious drug problem. Anyway, so I had been staying in CR for about three weeks at the time. I was supposed to be going to class daily, which I did not do. I spent most of my days instead sleeping off hangovers, and every night was spent with my friends from school at the local clubs on the main strip in Tamarindo. The clubs there closed down anywhere between 3 to 6 a.m. We, my friends and I, would usually head down to the 24-hour bar on the beach after the clubs closed. This 24-hour beach bar would be packed with tourists and locals, all pouring out of the clubs and out onto the beach to continue drinking. And there is where my story starts. It was probably around 4 a.m. The club I was at had closed down, so I made my way to the beach bar with groups of people, most of them I didn't know at all. I was already pretty damn drunk, just chatting with people and having a good time. The drinks were still flowing and I felt safe enough. Eventually a local man, probably in his mid-thirties, sparked a conversation with me. 
We chatted as best we could, but he didn't speak very much English, and I didn't speak a lick of Spanish. Eventually, he asked me if I did cocaine, which I replied, yes, I did. He took a baggie of coke out and began feeding me sniffs with a plastic card. I must have done about 10 to 15 bumps. As soon as I'd sniff one, he'd be preparing another. Keep in mind, at the time, I was a very petite 17-year-old girl weighing about 95 pounds. I must have just looked completely out of it, because then a friend from my school approached me and told me he wanted to make sure I got home okay. I remember thanking that local coke man and saying I was going to leave. Even though I was out of it, I could sense he was very angry that I was being taken away. He said goodbye, though, and let me leave with my friend. To get back to our school from the beach, you have to walk ten minutes on a dirt path through this dense forest, like you're walking in a Costa Rican jungle in pitch black at night. No lights at all. My friend and I are there, walking through this jungle back to my school. I'm completely out of my mind coked up, and I couldn't even walk anymore. I spotted a small clearing in the trees and told him I had to stop and lay down for a bit. We spent about 20 minutes laying in the bush clearing, staring up at the tops of the trees, listening to the leaves brush against one another, the morning birds singing their songs. I could see the sun was coming up just now. Finally, when my coke buzz began to die down, we got back up and continued through the forest toward the school. Walked another 10 minutes and we had finally arrived at the back entrance of our gated school. We used the key fob to get in, then closed the back gate which automatically locked behind us. My friend and I sat on a ledge near the back door and talked for another 15 minutes until he decided to go up to his room for the night. I decided to lay myself into a hammock to finally fall asleep outside. The hammock I was laying on was right near the back door, maybe about 20 feet or so away. I remember closing my eyes and feeling myself fall deep asleep, and then I heard it. A tapping on the fence of the back gate. I lifted my head up from the hammock and was completely surprised. It was that coke man, the local guy from the 24-hour beach bar. He had caught me completely off guard. My mind was racing. I couldn't understand why he was all the way at my school now. Being the naive teenager that I was, I smiled and shook my head no at him politely. I think I rattled off something about being tired. He motioned for me to unlock the back door and kept waving me over. I had this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. I smiled politely and again told him I was too tired. Through the fence, he took a baggie of coke out of his pocket and showed it to me, waving me over. Now remember, I was a 17-year-old idiot who didn't care about life. When I saw that coke bag, I slowly got myself up out of the hammock and walked over to the coke man. I laughed, thinking about it now. He kept trying to coax me to come out and sit with him. After barely any persuasion, I decided to unlock the gate slowly. Just for a minute, I told him. I remember seeing this complete excitement in his eyes when I clicked open the lock. I opened the gate and stepped out of the school grounds, sitting on a rock beside him. I remember as soon as the gate closed behind me and I sat down, he immediately started feeding me more lines until I couldn't even see straight. I remember not being able to move my legs and feeling very weak. It probably wasn't even coke. I have to go now, I told him, barely being able to form the words. He became aggressive. He grabbed my arm, begging me, Please stay, I have a present for you. I could sense his desperation and I was finally starting to feel like I was in danger. The desperation in his eyes was something I still feel when I think back on it. We were both standing up now, and he was gripping my arm so hard. I remember his hands were cold even though we were in a tropical forest. It was so weird. Anyway, out of nowhere, the school security guard burst through the back door. Hey, what's going on here? Are you okay? The coke man immediately let me go and I hopped back into the school grounds. The security guard closed the door. I could see the man running back through the forest where he'd come from. In the moment, I didn't realize, but now I know that the coke man had not only started following us when we left the beach bar, but he hid somewhere and waited while my friend and I laid on the ground for 20 minutes. When we started making our way to the school again, 
He followed us all the way back to the school grounds. Then he waited another 15 minutes hiding, watching for my friend to leave, until I was completely alone. I don't know what he had planned for me, but I'm grateful that the school security guard came right at the right time. Okay, so this happened to me earlier, and I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight. I'm currently staying in a remote part of the United Kingdom and having a bit of a break from working, which means more time to pursue my hobbies, one of those hobbies being photography. I had scoped out a creepy looking tree formation in a nearby forest and set my camera and tripod up as the sun was coming down, you know, for that extra creepy vibe. As I was there happily taking photos, I see a woman pass the entrance to the arched trees. This woman had parked her car next to mine when I arrived. She went past a couple of times, looking at me for prolonged periods with each time she passed by. I assumed she wanted to come up this path but saw I was taking photos, so she just decided to walk elsewhere. Approximately five minutes go by, and she appears again, this time walking towards me, dragging her left side slightly with this strange limp. She stops once and stares at me for a few seconds, then starts walking toward me again. I called out to her and asked if she was okay. I was starting to put my camera away at this point and readying my tripod to use for self-defense if necessary because the vibe I was getting from her was way off. She started doing these weird grunts at me then stopped and stared again. It was at this point that this woman was close enough for me to realize that she was actually a man in woman's clothing, with a wig as well. An uncomfortable moment passed. She started grunting again, walking toward the edge of the path. She grabbed a pile of leaves and started tossing them around, grunting some more, then walked off aimlessly into the forest. I called my friend to tell her about this weird experience that just happened and asked that she stayed on the phone with me, just in case this person came back. I was just going to take a couple of more photos, then I was out. For a good ten minutes or so, I could hear the crunching of leaves circling me in the forest. I convinced myself it was just the wildlife. After a while though, there was silence. I start taking the photos. I hadn't seen or heard the person for around 15 minutes now, so I assumed I was safe. I leave the path and see that the car is gone. Thank fuck. I very quickly notice, though, that now there's a man walking toward me from the entrance. I take note that it's the same fucking guy. He had changed into men's attire. As he walks past me, he shoots me this grin that sends shivers down my spine. I don't scare easily but this guy just gave off all the wrong signals, causing this overwhelming feeling of dread to wash over me. I'm still on the phone at this point, holding my tripod over my shoulder just in case. I quickened my pace and got back into my car. As I did so, I saw him come out of the lane I had been down, stop and look around, then start walking toward my car with intent. I videoed him walking toward me, then hauled the fuck out of there, driving past his car that he had moved and hidden down the road, thinking to myself, what in the gray beard fuck just happened? This happened about five or six years ago. My friends and I were freshmen in high school. We frequently went into the woods near our school that had some abandoned structures. Sometimes we went in there to smoke, graffiti, or just otherwise explore. It was always a pretty fun time. On a fall day after school, we decided to go exploring in the woods like we usually did. For the first 10 or 15 minutes into our adventure, everything was fairly normal. Eventually, we came across a tree that had a dagger sticking out of it. Immediately, I got this horrible feeling. One of my friends, Nathan, went over to the tree and took the dagger out. Sure enough, it was 100% real. I'm not exactly sure what I was hoping for. 
I guess I was hoping that it was some sort of gag toy or something. We all just kind of looked at each other a little weirded out, but didn't think too much of it. Maybe someone left it in there before we came to mess with whoever came across it or something. That's what we were hoping for, at least. Nathan put the dagger into his backpack, and we continued on with our adventure. It wasn't long after we came across this tree, though, that things started to get a bit weird. I was the first of us to notice it. There was a man in all black trailing us, keeping a good distance away. He was always off to the right of us, hiding behind some tree or bush. From what I could see, he looked to be an average height man wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. I wanted to leave the second I saw him, but when I told my friends what I had seen, I don't think any of them believed me. They just kind of laughed me off. Either they thought I was just seeing things, or they thought someone was just messing with us and didn't feel very threatened by it. By the time we were about 40 minutes into the woods, they finally saw him. This time he was a lot closer though, maybe about 30 or so feet away from us. I couldn't make out much detail about his face, because he had his hood on and his head down. I could see he was wearing some sort of white t-shirt underneath his hoodie though. Everyone froze for a brief moment. There were four of us all together. We just stared, not really sure what to do in this sort of situation. Everyone stood in silence for three very long, very scary seconds until he ran further back into the woods behind some trees and we could no longer see him. I grabbed onto Nathan's arm who was the closest to me and whispered, We have to go now! I just had this horrible pit in my stomach. At first, we made our way back to the entrance of the woods at a jogging pace. I think we were all trying to downplay this experience in our minds, to not invoke pure fear and panic. We kept at that pace for a minute or two, until we heard leaves crunching and sticks breaking right behind us. We turned around, and there he was trailing us. We start running, and he starts chasing after us. I was the one behind the group, so the man was closest to me. I could hear his heavy breathing in my ears. That's how close he was to me, just an arm's length away. We picked up our speed. I thought for sure I was going to pass out because I was fairly out of shape, but luckily we made it out in about 25 minutes. Stopping once or twice to catch our breath when we were sure the man wasn't in sight. Once we all got out, we just kind of looked at each other, trying to figure out what the fuck just happened. We didn't talk about much after that. I don't think any of us wanted to think about it for too long. Looking back on it now, we probably should have reported it to the police in case the man tried to hurt any other innocent kids going into those woods. I don't know if it was him that placed that dagger in the tree or why it was there. Honestly, I don't think I want to know about it. I don't know why he was there or what his intentions were. I'm just glad we got away, and I hope he hasn't hurt or tried to hurt anyone since. So to the man who followed and chased my friends and I in the woods, let's not meet again. This happened to my roommate and I two years ago when we drove into the National Forest just outside of the town we live in. We go to a small college in New England, about three hours away from any major city. For context, this forest has quite a few urban legends surrounding it, and the local community, although they do go there often, have a lot of superstitions about how to be safe whilst there. I had just broken up with my partner, and my roommate could sense I was really feeling down. Finals were just around the corner, so she decided to help me get my mind off of things. She suggested we go to a nice spot she had found just last week, and just chill out and de-stress. We took a couple of beers with us, and drove to this secluded spot in the forest. From the moment we left the main asphalt road in the forest, I saw a couple of things that immediately unsettled me. You could see the abandoned houses of a ghost town from the higher ground the road was on. I saw this old doll hanging from a rope on a tree. 
Some creepy shit for sure, but we really didn't give it a second thought and just continued driving. We got to a clearing and parked our car behind some trees, popped open the back of our SUV, and just started chatting and playing some music. About ten minutes into this, two cars appeared from the road and parked in the clearing as well. My friend didn't pay them any attention. Instead, she just kept talking. But as I was facing them from where I sat, I couldn't stop myself from seeing what they did. I saw a guy pop out of each car, talk for a few minutes. Then I saw them take out this long object covered in a dark plastic bag from the back of one of the cars. This is when I noticed these guys had guns. Not like shotguns, which you see often in this type of town, but handguns. They started lighting the bag on fire. I told my friend to get down. She turned around and saw them for the first time. Black, thick smoke was rising from the bag, and between trying to keep my head down and steal glances at them, I saw them take out a second object. I heard them shoot at it, right before they set that on fire too. I don't know how long my friend and I were lying there in silence, but it was definitely enough to let the terror sink in and whisper to each other how much we loved each other, just in case this was what we thought it was. At some point, I dared to look up and saw they were pointing at our car. We saw them walking into the woods, maybe trying to follow our tracks or look for us. All I know is that right then, I told my friend to hop into the driver's seat and make a run for it. I shut the back door, and between that and the car starting up, the guys heard it and started running right towards us. Then they ran towards one of their cars and hopped in. We drove over a hill, and driving way above what was safe for dirt roads on a hillside, we lost them. We drove to a neighboring town and roamed around for a while, just to make sure no one was following us, before we went back to our dorm. That day, we tried to make fun of the whole situation and got really drunk before finally breaking down and crying from knowing we had seen something we were not supposed to. We were at first terrified of telling anyone, but we did eventually tell officers on campus who contacted the police for us. They never found anything in the end, though. I wasn't entirely sure about sharing this story. It gives me shivers every time I remember what happened. This happened in the Amazonas, in the border between Brazil and Peru. The jungle, it's an amazing place to live. Everyone knew each other and I had a big group of friends of different ages. The only horrible part about the Amazon is the existence of terrorist groups that try to control the region. I was seven when this happened. Every kid in the village knew we had freedom to go anywhere, as long as it was not close to the terrorists, and that we could never leave the village at night. My parents taught me, since I was very little, how to hide just in case something happened, and to run if I saw things will get dangerous. I remember all the adults of the village were celebrating something. I think it was an Amazonian party like Halloween. I remember my mother painting her face in a tribal way. All the children went together to a house to stay safe and have fun. The eldest girl was in charge. She was 17, and as soon as our parents left, she ignored us and left with her friends. Our closest group consisted of six children. I was the youngest one, and we all listened to the most adventurous one there, Leon, who was 14. Whatever Leon said, we followed, because he was fun, always making challenges, and he knew how to take care of us. Yes, despite him being quite reckless, he was our good friend. We loved him, and knew he would never abandon us if something bad happened. After playing soccer for a while and eating, the six of us became quite bored. Carla, one of the six, had the idea to dress up like our parents did, with tribal makeup and dresses. We agreed, and soon we were all dressed up like the kids who lived in the village of the deepest parts of the Amazon. I remember us all playing around and having a lot of fun, until Leon said, and I quote, Let's go explore the Amazon and find a hidden treasure. We all cheered and agreed to leave. 
It was easy enough to escape since the girl who was supposed to take care of us had already left. Leon managed to find a lantern and a boat big enough for us six. We decided to set sail. It was around midnight, but we didn't care too much. Just imagine six kids dressed up on a boat, splashing water everywhere, trying to find this imaginary treasure. No phones, no adults, just the jungle and us. It was life at its purest. Everything seemed to be going perfectly, until we suddenly heard someone calling out, Who's there? We saw this lighted boat approaching. Quickly, Leon dropped the lantern and instructed us to lay down on the boat's floor and stay very still. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. I remember very clearly how we were all with our bellies on the floor, grabbing our hands and not even daring to breathe. But it was already too late. Stop hiding. I see you, a voice said as the man illuminated our boat. We stood up and saw four men with rifles pointing at us. They laughed and said, Look, it's a bunch of children. Leon put himself in front of us defensively and said we were on a hurry because our parents were expecting us home soon. The biggest man, who was wearing a red bandana, laughed and said, Little kids shouldn't be alone here at night. You could disappear here in the jungle and no one would ever find you. At this point, I was super scared, and Carla started crying. You can go. You just tried babies. Then they left. I remember all of us hugging each other, crying and sailing as fast as we could out of there. Once we got home, we entered the house and closed all the doors and windows. We slept together on the floor, but before that, we agreed not to tell this to anyone in the village, not the elders or our parents. Even now, no one knows what happened that night. Years later, I understood why they let us go. They thought we were kids from that local tribe we dressed up as. We had no value to them. If they had known we were just dressed up and we were actually from the village, I probably wouldn't be here typing this story.